Welcome to EPG Patshala. We are discussing today the course on social policy. The specific module under discussion is education policy in the context of India. My name is Sohini Sengupta. I am a faculty in the School of Social Work at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. Education has been a key development concern for much of the last century. In many parts of the world, education remains a goal to be achieved for sizable sections of the population. Uh, this basically means that although we all value education, we haven't been very successful in providing it to uh, all people in the world. From a human capital perspective, schooling develops human qualities increases people's economic productivity and promotes economic growth. Education, however, also plays a less instrumental role by enabling redistributive and empowering role. As citizens from all sections of society obtain education, they are able better to participate in democratic decision making and therefore also benefit from economic development. These are different ways of looking at education. The objective of this module is uh, to enable students to understand the normative frameworks that underpin education policy anywhere in the world, the historical background of education policy in India, um, flowing into the formulation of the Right to Education Act. The key points of the draft National Education Policy 2016, we will also look at recent trends in education attainment in India and international norms and goals in education policy. There are three main normative frameworks that are used to evaluate and design education policies and institution. These are human capital, capabilities approach, and the human rights perspective. Under the human capital perspective, the economic value of schooling is promoted. From this perspective, schooling develops human qualities and increases economic productivity. It enables individuals to acquire the right kind of skills and the right kind of qualities to be able to compete in the job market and obtain for them adequate livelihoods and sources of income. Major social obligation, therefore, from this perspective is to improve access to schooling through more efficient schools such that economic growth is facilitated. What it basically means is, uh, it does not matter who provides the schooling. It does not also matter how expensive schooling is. What basically is required is that good quality education is provided to people and also the right type of education is provided to people which would enable them to better participate in opportunities for economic growth. From a human development or capabilities approach perspective, um, education uh, is more than just the means to obtain adequate income or the means to fuel economic growth. The capabilities approach encompasses the human capital idea but moves beyond it by emphasizing the importance of education for developing people's capabilities as well as their critical abilities the re to reason about the kinds of lives they would like to live, the kind of societies that they would like to inhabit. Basically, it enables people to participate in democratic decision making about their own lives. It helps them to become, if you remember our citizenship modules, better citizens. It enables them to understand their rights and entitlements. It enables them to fulfill their obligations better. It also, of course, as human capital capital proponents believe enables them to participate in economic development and benefit from it. From the human rights approach, the significance of education is the fact that it is a basic right that should be available to all individuals in modern societies. From this approach, right to education is often linked to universal declaration of human rights 1948 article 26 1 which states that everyone has a right to education the idea then is not what one does with the education one gets whether it means getting better jobs or becoming better citizens or being able to reason about lives 
irrespective of what one does with the education one gets or what the outcome is education is a human right that should be available to everybody irrespective of what they do with it they also talk about article 13 which is part of the international covenant on economic social and cultural rights 1966 which states that education is the primary vehicle by which economically and socially marginalized adults and children can lift themselves out of poverty and obtain the means to participate fully in their communities, which Article 13 speaks to both the human capital and the development capabilities approach by encompassing these ideas uh, within this conception of right to education. Article 14 uh, of Article 14 talks about compulsory education that should be provided to all free of charge. So therefore, the human rights perspective not only talks about education as right, it also talks about education, free education and compulsory education that should be available to all, irrespective of who they are. If we want to look at the the way in which education policy has been designed and implemented and conceptualized in our country, uh, we always begin in 1966 with the creation of the Kothari Commission and the national education policy that emerged from it in 1968. Let us look at some of the key recommendations of the NP 1968 because that is considered to be the precursor of all the other, the way in which our educational institutions have shaped up in our country. The NPE spoke about a national system of education which essentially meant that uh, a standard uniform quality education should be provided to every citizen no matter where they lived in the country. It also spoke about universal full-time education to be provided to all children of the common school type. It envisaged an understanding of a common school system which meant that uh, irrespective of what, what community or what class or whether you were rich or poor, one should go to only a, one type of school and which by which they described as the common school system. The idea was to erase the class and caste and other status distinctions in society and also providing equal opportunity to all citizens of the country in the future. The free common school system of public education, uh, it was proposed, should be extended up to standard 10. Uh, the idea was also to adopt the neighborhood school concept in the context of elementary education so that people did not have to travel far to access their schools. Um, the idea was children living in the remotest areas should be able to access uh, primary school education. The idea was to bring all types of private schools under the common school system so that common syllabus and common types of quality education material could be taught to all. Expansion of scholarship programs uh, was encouraged in order to allow people from different economic backgrounds to access education. Policy also recommended expanding the centrally sponsored section in education so that states could be supported in their initiatives towards providing education to all. It also spoke about increasing the proportion of expenditure of government as a percentage of gross national product up to 6%. In fact, uh, one thing that we should mention out here is that we still haven't achieved the 6% of GNP uh, spending in education, something that was uh, proposed way back in 1968. We still spend much less amount of money on education than what we thought we should be spending in the 60s. The National Education Policy uh, 1968 envisaged a particular type of role of the state in the provisioning of education. The Commission emphasized the importance of free and compulsory education, just like the Human Rights Framework speaks about, uh, till up to grade 10, and to be provided from the common schooling system. It emphasized major role of the state and central government in financing education. Up to 90% of contribution should be from central government. It recommended the abolition of fees in higher education, and eventually uh, that should be the ultimate goal of education policy that everybody can also access, not just elementary and secondary, but also higher education. The commission viewed the role of private sector as minimal in the provisioning of education. Uh, it suggested that private sector 
provisioning of education be regulated. Uh, however, this suggestion was not taken by the government at that time. The national education policy in 1986 took some of these ideas forward, but also created some new innovations in education policy. Uh, if you notice, there was almost 20 years between the two education policies. The things were pretty much uh, not very different between 60s and the late 80s. The NPE 1986 emerged out of a review of the national education system by the National Institute of of education planning and administration. The 1986 policy emphasized universal enrollment and universal retention of children up to the age of 14 years in all schools. The, despite the policy recommendation in the earlier times of allowing all children to complete elementary education and making it possible for them to do so, a large number of children continued to be out of school, which led to the emphasis of enrollment and retention in NPE 1986. The 1986 policy also encouraged emerging sectors like information technology. This witnessed an upsurge following the opening up of the technical education sector, particularly in the private sector. Rapid expansion of a large number of private engineering and medical colleges was made possible after the uh, NPE 1986. This was the first step towards privatization of higher education in the country, especially in specific um, technical and uh, medical fields. In the 90s, the Ramamurthy Committee was constituted to review the NPE 1986. Some of the stated goals were the abolition of capitation fee and addressing the elitist bias in the educational system. One of the important recommendations of the committee was the inclusion of right to education as the fundamental right in the Constitution of India. One of the key recommendations of the Kothari Commission, that is in 1966, which was adopted by NPE 68, was increasing the investment of ed in education up to 60% of GNP. The goal could not be reached as the goal was reiterated in subsequent national education policies 86, 1990 and by the Ramamurthy Commission in 1992 and in all the five-year plans from the eighth plan onwards and in all political party manifestos till present. From the late 1990s, there was a change in emphasis about the nature of investment in education and according to some commentators, this was an important shift. It was argued in some political party manifestos and planning commission reports that India has attained its long aspired goal and as articulated in the early education policy of spending 6% uh, of its national income on education. This interpretation was reached based on including all private expenditure in education, including family expenses and private sector, in addition to government expenditure. However, the earlier education policies as well as key United Nations documentation always refer to public expenditure when we are talking about investment in education. The right to education finally became a law and was enacted by the parliament in 2009 to provide free and compulsory education to children between 6 and 14 years. So far in the earlier national policies, uh, earlier national policies had recommended the implementation of free and compulsory education, but it's only with the coming of the Right to Education Act that this became a justiciable entitlement. Three new provisions were added to the Indian constitution to enable the formulation of the right to education. Article 21A was added to the fundamental rights in part 3. Article 45 was modified and a new clause K was added in Article 51A, fundamental duties. 51A interestingly made parents and guardians responsible for providing education to their children between 6 to 14 years, which essentially means that if you're a parent and your child in the age group of 6 to 14 does not attend any schools, then you are liable for a penalty because it's your primary responsibility to ensure that they are enrolled in a, in a school. Free and compulsory elementary education. What that essentially means is um, there is no direct school fees or indirect cost such as in for uniforms, textbooks, midday meals and transportation to be borne by children or the parents to obtain elementary education. The government will provide schooling free of cost until a child's elementary education is completed. But how is the government 
planning to achieve this. One of the interesting innovations of the Right to Education Act and which often makes people talk about it as a public-private partnership of some sort is that it, it stipulates that private schools have to reserve 25% of their seats at the entry level for children belonging to disadvantaged groups and weaker sections in society. A child that who belongs to a disadvantaged group belongs to either a scheduled caste or scheduled tribes or socially or educationally backward class or any such groups facing disadvantage owing to social, cultural, economic, geographical, linguistic, gender or other similar factors. Also a child with parental income less than 2 lakhs per annum. Mentally and physically challenged children are also entitled to free education in special schools were included in this definition through an amendment in 2012. So essentially, uh, free and compulsory education would be provided not just in public schools, schools run by government, but also 25% of the seats in private schools would be reserved for children of such families. The Constitution 93rd Amendment Act 2005 inserted Clause 5 in Article 15, which enabled the state to make special provisions for members of the SE, ST, and socially and educationally backward classes for admission to all educational institutions. This provision included private, unaided institutions, but excluded minority institutions. The idea was to equalize the playing field as far as social disadvantage goes, such that children from all communities are able to access education even in the even in the context where these educational services were not necessarily being provided by the government in May 2014 a five judge constitution bench upheld the provision of the RTE Act 2009 and RTE rules 2010 the bench said that article 15.5 is consistent with the socialistic goals set out in the preamble and the directive principles which was to ensure the march and progress of the weaker section resulting in progress to socialistic democratic state establishing the egalitarian ethos egalitarian equality which is the mandate of the constitution this was a very interesting ruling and uh, this, uh, by through this ruling, what the court did was it located education policy, uh, situated it within the broader normative goals of social policy, which is to create equality in the society, which is to create an egalitarian ethos in the society. So, therefore, education uh, here has been conceptualized broadly as as a human right and also as a means to reduce social disadvantage. The major shortcomings, the major shortcomings in making the right to education actually work or despite having very good intentions is the shortage of 12 lakh teachers in primary schools, 20% of the teachers employed remain untrained. The student-teacher ratio also falls short of the prescribed norms. In a lot of places, school infrastructure is not in place. Another increasingly worrying trend in uh, school education has been, despite the rising enrollment rates and uh, decent retention rates, the learning outcomes from these schools have been very poor. 64.8% of the primary schools uh, that were surveyed did not have toilets for boys and girls in 2011 and 12. India also has about 600,000 untrained teachers and 500,000 vacant positions. Basically, staff shortages and infrastructural disadvantages is making it difficult perhaps to make all the goals of right to education uh, come true in the context of India. Um, in 2002, the government of India launched the centrally sponsored cream scheme Sharva, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan SSA to provide quality elementary education to children. It is currently India's main program to universalize elementary education. The SSA goals are to provide all children 6 to 14 age group education of satisfactory quality in schools and education guarantee centers to bridge gender and social category gaps and also to um, create universal retention by 2012. What are the provisions of the SSA? Opening of new schools and alternate schooling facilities, construction of schools and additional classrooms, toilets and drinking water facilities, provisioning for teachers, 
periodic teacher training and academic resource support, providing textbooks and other support for learning achievement free of cost. SSA performance. Uh, looking at the evaluation reports of SSA uh, performance in India, uh, several outcomes were, uh, have been documented. SSA had succeeded in expanding access to education. By 2011, 350,000 schools were constructed covering 99% rural habitation within a radius of one kilometer. It improved pupil-teacher ratios. 1.12 million teachers were recruited to bring down pupil-teacher ratios to accepted norms. It resulted in a decline in the dropout rate. The dropout rate declined by half from 40% to 20% from 2001-2 to 2009-10. It also improved gender inequality and uh, improved the gender parity from 0.83 to 1 and 0.77 to 0.96 in primary and upper primary levels respectively during the same period. SSA differed in scale and structure from prior initiatives by the government to improve school enrollment. Uh, these prior initiatives were uh, programs like Operation Blackboard and District Primary Education Programs, DPEP. SSA is funded by a special tax known as the Education CES. The CES is a 2% tax on all union tax and money is kept in a separate fund called Elementary Education Fund or Prathamik uh, Prarambhik Shiksha Kosh, PSK. PSK funds are used for SSA and midday meals. SSA has both state and district level implementation structure that have been set up uh, in parallel to the line departments. All of this has made implementation of uh, the goals under creating universal enrollment in primary education uh, come true uh, in the context of SSA. In addition to SSA, one of the other programs that we should mention here is the initiative called the Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyalaya. The Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyalaya was opened in educa educationally backward blocks where female rural literacy rates were exceptionally high. These are also the places where girls did not go to school and if they did go to school, they did not stay in school for a really long time. The literacy rates of women were also much lower in these areas among certain socially disadvantaged communities such as SC, ST, OBC Muslim and below poverty line families. The objective of the KGBV program was to bring out schoolgirls in the age group of 11 years and above category living in backward and remote areas into the formal education system. The idea was to spread the benefit of education to groups uh, who lived in remote areas and also to social categories who traditionally did not educate girls. There are more than 3,000 KGBV spread across the backward states of the country today as a consequence of this program. Let us now look at where we have come in our quest to provide education to all. The draft national education policy 2016 is the latest addition to the number of policies and laws that we have enacted to be able to provide education to everybody. The specific goals of the draft NEP in, is increasing the gross enrollment ratio in secondary and higher education and reducing the high levels of adult illiteracy in the country. Essentially, uh, the elementary education goals are considered to have been fulfilled um, in India and now the emphasis has moved to secondary and higher education. Recent survey highlights that the learning outcome remains unsatisfactory. Inadequate training and performance absenteeism among teachers are viewed as contributing to poor quality learning and this is another area that the NEP 2016 hopes to amend. Till recently the emphasis was on bringing children to school and keeping them there. Bringing children from remote and socially disadvantaged groups to school and keeping there. Ensuring that high cost of education does not prevent everyone from attending schools. All these initiatives led to rising enrollment rates up for both girls and boys all over the country. It still did not uh, it still did not compensate for, it still did not lead to great learning outcomes among children. So the draft NEP is not only emphasizing on learning outcomes, it's also emphasizing on higher levels of education and how to bring, how to persuade people to stay more number of years in schools and then go for higher education or vocational training. Poor quality curriculum in higher education, accreditation based on performance, lack of funding and infrastructure are also identified as problems. 
So the quality of education is also another factor that the draft NEP is looking at. Lack of institutional support for technical and vocational education and skill building has always been a lacuna in the higher education system in our country, which is, uh, according to some commentators, is leading to a large number of educated and unemployed people in the country. The idea of the new education policy is to streamline curriculum so that the the education that people obtain uh, should feed into the requirements of the diverse, diversified economy. Um, right. Another innovation that the NAP brings in is the funding of higher education institute and linking it up with the quality of curriculum and uh, the performance of these educational institute, which essentially means that um, uh, Educational institutes would have to become more accountable in terms of what kind of, what quality of teaching they are imparting and what quality of learning are their students emerging out and whether they then become suitable for employment in the new modern growing economy. Government statistics on education has in the past focused on school enrollment of children and inputs provided to school. Less emphasis was given on assessing whether children were actually learning anything, that is obtain, obtaining basic education. In real context, children may be physically present in school and not obtain an education. This is an emerging debate in the context of education in the country in which uh, observers, commentators, scholars and policy makers are increasingly uh, worried about the poor quality learning in schools in the country. Education surveys are absolutely significant because it tells us various things about how schools are working, whether schools are performing, whether children attend school, whether they learn anything in school, and what are the different requirements that schools have. Annual household surveys undertaken by ACER annual status of education survey report since 2005 evaluate the extent to which children enrolled in government and private schools in diverse location across all districts in the country are obtaining basic education the ASER reports of the last the last ASER report is uh, available uh, online free of cost for all of you to read and and to see because it gives you a state wise picture of the extent to which uh, children who go to school are actually uh, learning anything or not. Since 2005, the ASER surveys have found that children lack basic educational skills such as reading. For example, despite attending school for many years, uh, nearly 50% of all children in standard 5 were unable to read a standard 2 level text and even by grade 8, 25% of all children fail to read standard 2 texts. The inability of children to be able to develop basic literacy and numeracy skills remain worrying even as educational infrastructure and other forms of resources are being pumped into uh, uh, the sector of education. Sustainable Development Goal 4, to which all uh, signatory countries are going to be um, committed to in the near future, is about ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. Um, according to the SDG Goal 4, free and quality primary and secondary education must lead to effective learning. Access to early childhood and pre-primary education must be emphasized. Women and men should have equal access to technical, vocational and tertiary education, which would improve their chances and opportunities in the labor market. Eliminating gender disparities and ensuring equal access to vulnerable groups. Achieving literacy and numeracy by all adults and youth. Upgrading educational facilities, providing safe, sensitive, inclusive learning environments, and improving teachers' training and supply of quality teachers. All of these um, targets under SDG 4 has also been incorporated uh, as debates and consultations around draft education policy 2016 uh, is underway in the country. With that, we come to an end of the module on education policy. To summarize briefly, we learned about the different normative ways in which education is looked at. We looked at the human rights approach, the human capabilities approach, and the human cap capital approach. We 
we try to um, we try to understand the evolution of education policy in uh, in our country from the early 1960s where the emphasis was the provisioning of free and compulsory education and increasing public investment in education uh, to the draft national education policy 2016 which is emphasizing not just primary but also higher education uh, quality of education and also tertiary level vocational and other types of uh, skills which are required for the diverse diversified economy we also looked at we also tried to understand how education policies uh, strive to reduce inequality in the society by improving access and affordability for socially disadvantaged groups so that education truly becomes a right for all. Thank you.